Hello everybody, welcome to this Zoom discussion with Amanita Dreamer, who I would consider the expert on preparing and using Amanita Muscaria. It is not something I'm putting on my normal YouTube channel because YouTube has a tendency to want to take down the use of uh, medicines that are not approved by the FDA so far. And there is a lot of science that is being worked on with this mushroom, but uh, we're at the very early stages, so I find it kind of interesting to continue this conversation. I wouldn't see any of this as pseudoscience because there's actually science about these chemicals. They just have been not well studied. They've also been used for at least 10,000 years, probably a lot more. They're one of the oldest uh, hallucinogens, one of the oldest uh, medicines uh, that alter your state of mind. They are, however, legal so I can talk about them in a legal way. I have a couple of packages of Amanita, by the way, that I am going to prepare myself. So I'm asking questions for myself to Amanita Dreamer, who, by the way, is going to give some disclaimers. She can't give medical advice to anybody. So without further ado, um, oh, and one last thing. <laughs> If you don't know who I am, my name is Rob Nelson. I run Untamed Science and Stone Age Man. And I just feel like it's important to get some of this information out there because I have had a very difficult time finding it myself. And so if you came across this and you're like, hey, I like what you're doing, go to those two things on YouTube and uh, the website and you can follow more. Also, Amanita Dreamer is on amanitadreamer.net and she has a full resource of things that you can find there. Okay, I'm gonna let her just start off and explain where her, where she's coming from, and then we'll dive into how to prepare Amanita muscaria, mostly as a tea, and then we'll get to a couple other alternative ways to prepare it as well, and some Q&A. Oh, and this is me coming in now in the past and saying I forgot to record it not on Gallery View, so you're just gonna have to see it in Gallery View, okay. You all know by now, I'm Amanita Dreamer, and you've seen the videos, so I'm not going to rehash all of that. And for any patrons that come later of Stone Age Man and you just signed up, there's a video, there's two videos on his channel about the Amanita muscaria mushroom. And you should go watch those or you won't have much of a reference for what we're doing here today. And we did this because... The response was overwhelming to those videos, and we felt like there was such an influx of questions that we really wanted to give people a chance to ask. So mm -hmm. welcome to being a patron, and then thanks for being a patron. And then this is for, for patrons. We're sorry you couldn't be here with us today. And for those of you with us today, feel free to ask whatever you'd like. If I can answer it, I will. Having said that, and you've watched those videos, then what we're doing today is if you went to amnitadreamer.net, you went through there, you watched videos, but you still have questions because I still have so many videos to make. I'm, I'm only three years in, I'm making videos as fast as I can. There's still a lot I haven't covered, or if it just wasn't clear, or if video isn't the best way that you learn, whatever, or you just wanna say hi. <laughs> so we're here for that. I wanna let you know, I am limited by law with some things and I cannot, speak to any one of you personally about your medical health. I can't even tell you that this would be good for you. I can tell you what the science says. I can tell you what my opinions are. I can tell you how I use it. But if you ask me a pointed question about yourself and your life, your medications, any of that, I can't answer that. Because in, in America, we have a law called practicing medicine without a license. It is a serious offense and I could go to prison for it. So that includes acting as a therapist. So I also can't talk to you about emotional things or choices that you're making. I can listen. I can tell you we have a forum and the links to my world are on my website. And there's a tab that says, get involved. You can go there and go to our forum and ask there because everyone can give their opinion there and say what they wanna say. So having all that out of the way, I want to talk to you about preparation because some of you, I mean, you may have seen the video, but some of you are still asking questions, especially like about lemon and stuff like that. Can, can I pause you for a second sure. there? Because I, I had a couple questions that were related to that. Do you, is that why, because you re referenced before that some of your videos were taken down off of YouTube. And is that why, like from a legal standpoint, 
it's legal in most places minus it looks like Louisiana, the Netherlands, Thailand, and Romania. So that's actually a good thing, I think. But is it more of like, what is your, your reference for why people you think are taking some of the content down? So back in March, YouTube went on a takedown spree and they started out with all drug channels and they took down anything related to anything that's not FDA approved as a drug. So they took down all the illegal channels, anything in reference to cannabis, anything that was in reference to psilocybin, but they took down my channel. And one of the problems I think is that a lot of people use this mushroom as a stylized version of psilocybin. And I'm doing my best to get the word out to please stop using an Amanita muscaria mushroom as a representation for psilocybin because it's hurting our community because I get caught up in censorship with that. So I was talking to other people in the mushroom community and I learned that not only did they take down anything illegal, but they were taking down legal drugs like Kratom. So that was back in March. And I thought I was wrongly taken down all my mushroom content, even foraging and picking this mushroom got taken down. Even if I didn't reference using it, even if I was giving identification information, biologically educational based identification, those videos got taken down. I thought it was wrong. I tried to appeal it. I mounted a campaign on Twitter. It was, it was, there was just nothing, nothing. And I learned later that they've since started going after alternative medicine channels. They've even started going after things like chamomile. Uh, it, anything that is a natural medicine. I am not a conspiracy theorist. I will not get into conspiracy theories. I don't entertain it on my channel. But at this point, something's going on. If even legal things that are mild like chamomile tea is starting to get censored clearly there's an agenda somewhere somebody has got some reason that this has become a thing and whatever those are i don't know and it wouldn't matter whether we guess or not it doesn't matter mm -hmm. it is what it is and we got to live within those bounds and then two weeks ago instagram went on a takedown spree and they started removing the same so a lot of channels disappeared a lot of pages disappeared off of instagram two weeks ago mine included mm -hmm. And I tried to wage a campaign against that. It's gone. There's nothing I can do about it. We'll never get it back. So I've been trying to educate people that if you want to keep up with your creators, if you want to keep up with alternative medicine, you need to find where your creators live offline. I mean, off social media, find where their websites are. Because eventually, like I, we keep getting knocked down and popping up in other places. But if this continues, if it gets worse and nothing's done about it and there's no laws against social media or due process or anything like that, they can do anything they want. And I'm lucky I'm still on YouTube. I just don't know for how long. I, I've got a new Instagram page. I don't know how long. I've got a Facebook page. Those continually get deleted. I don't know why mine mm -hmm. hasn't yet. So, Well, you, I love I, – I'm just going to hop in here because I – I love how uh, blunt and honest you are with the use of all of this stuff and your experimentation with using it and everything. And I obviously come from a science background, but what I find is so neat about all of this is that it's it, it it's not in the world of like astrology, which people might throw into as like pseudoscience sometimes. Um, this actually has compounds that science is starting to show have real effects on the brain. And it just doesn't seem to be well studied. And yet, you know, with what you've done, you've been using it and found it to be very helpful. And so I feel like we're at the early stages of using this more broadly as a society. And that's what's really appealing to me about it. And it's, it's just so confusing that uh, there is this legal kind of people are taking it down and maybe seeing it wrongly. And that's why I feel like as a science communicator, I wanted to just kind of hop in and start having this conversation a little bit more. Well, it lends validity to it that psyched wellness is spearheading the science on this thing because they're looking to create products out of it and they are working on the, one. the company in Canada that you've yeah. been working yeah. with. Yeah. That so eventually they will have on the market a fully <clears throat> decarbed muscamol 
pill that you can take from the whole mushroom. So we'll get to that. So the ibotenic acid in this thing is what's toxic, but you know, the toxicity is highly overstated and that has a place. And if you take the full ibotenic acid side of it, you got to take it in really tiny doses because that stuff can mess with your digestive system, but you get all that energy and the upside of it and it hits all the cholinergic mm-hmm. receptors. And I have a whole video that goes into just complete hypotheses on my part about the pharmacology of it on the brain and the synapses and what it's doing in the synapses and why I believe it would be a good alternative treatment for ADD or just for attention or trying to get into some good gamma flow states. Right. So, okay, we've got, th- this is a, this is a great point for me to ask this. Um, I want to get into the prep, but I feel like to get into the prep, uh, so much of the prep is like, it's, it feels like a science um, lab experiment to me. It's like a chemistry problem that you're trying to solve when you do prep. Um, we did not talk in any of the videos we did about what it feels like to have more ibutenic acid or less because you have the ibutenic acid and muscimol, right? And preparation, from my understanding, seems to be trying to reduce ibutenic acid to some degree, although you might not want all of it gone, and get that converted over uh, to muscimol. So, but for somebody who, because because I didn't want to talk about this on the YouTube channel. From your perspective, how does it feel each of those chemicals? Like, like what does it feel like to take this? So the ibotenic acid feels like Adderall, only really clean. Adderall is dirty. It's edgy. It's jumpy. It's jerky. You can feel that it's fake and that it's just sort of forcing your brain to do something. Whereas ibotenic acid feels like a very natural state of being like it's just bringing to bear what you naturally have on board and just using it and focusing it uh, better in a better way. And because it's a living mushroom and it has all of the associated compounds for the entourage effect that we aren't even sure what they are, it feels very calm and very soothing and very smooth. But at the same time, a very high end flow state that the only way I know how to describe it was the movie Limitless, the drug that he was taking and the way that he could precognition something, the way that he could multitask his thoughts, the way that he could, his visual acuity was sharper. If you watch that movie, that's what ibotenic acid feels like. And I have to wonder if somebody didn't take this and and make that movie. And the coolest thing about ibotenic acid to me was even in my best flow states, in my sharpest states of thinking, I would focus on a single problem. And sometimes the answers would feel like I was just the muse, the the channel for it and the muse was solving the problem. If it was solving an issue at work or, or trying to write a book or whatever, like it would just flow effortlessly. But with ibotenic acid, I was solving multiple problems at once. It's the weirdest state of mind to ever be in. And what it would do is say, you know, that problem over here from yesterday, and you know, this problem right now, and you know, the problem from last year at this time, and you know, the problem you haven't had yet, but you're gonna, this is what they all have in common. And this is what your answer is. And then I would see futures of if I applied that answer how those then would unfold and cross over and then affect the future. And I would see it simultaneously and I could rotate it and look at it three-dimensionally, all of these futures with it. It's not unlike tripping on Amanita where you see alternate realities, only this gives you alternate futures. So like ibotenic acid is the future and muscimol, you can travel to the past. And that's why I like having both on board. And then your body, it's just, you don't hurt your muscle aches or whatever aren't there. You have more energy and strength to fire your muscles when you need them, where you need them. If you're overwhelmed, emotionally overburdened and mentally exhausted, like that's gone. The motivation side of things, it's just 100% pure focus, motivation and drive without chaos. Right. And so I think, I think that's, well, first of all, super fascinating. And 
I think a lot of people have looked over this mushroom because of the uh, the the perception of risk, right? Like I know almost everybody I talked to just assumed this was like borderline deadly mushroom, and you know they they you it might be a really bad trip, and you're just like playing Russian roulette with doing these mushrooms. And best experiences of my life have been on this mushroom. Well, and I, you know, I will for everyone out there who who follows me. I when we found him in Sweden, I did a deep dive on the way back. And I think that was the thing that blew me away is that when I really started looking into it, much of what I knew even about this mushroom was wrong. And so that then when we talked with you, it was a little bit of a, uh, you know, it reconfirmed what my thoughts were, but what are the risks? I mean, there's, there's some risks, it might not be death, but, but potentially if you took a lot, tell us that, and then we'll get into kind of basic prep. So the risks are that both of these are dose dependent and ibotenic acid can start to mess with you pretty quickly. It's not very forgiving as far as dose. So one bite, which I would say, find my little mushy here. So like a bite I would consider to be about that much. That for me is going to give me that experience I was telling you about. I've eaten twice as much and didn't get much more than that taking two bites, but it was a different mushroom. So because they vary so widely in strength from one mushroom to the next, like one year when I did it raw, it was one mushroom. And then the following year when I ate it raw and I took two bites, I got pretty much that same effect. So they were but just different strengths or whatever. And then a lot of people just take a bite in the morning when they go to work, they just break a little piece off. And then that's a lot of how original people's cultures use it. But you eat a whole one, like anything between what I described from a single bite up to eating, say this whole thing and throwing up and having diarrhea and having to sit on the toilet while you throw up in a garbage can. Like that's, that's the range in one cap. If it's a really weak mushroom, you could eat the whole thing and just have a good experience. If it's an unbelievably strong one, you could get a hot dose and wind up in the emergency room with it. So that's sort of the range there. If you go outside of that and you eat even more than that, then we're talking about getting into muscle twitches, uh, muscle spasms that are very painful in addition to the throwing up in the diarrhea. And then if you keep eating it or you eat a lot of them, two or three or five or whatever, then, yeah, you could wind up having seizures and go into mm -hmm. the emergency room with seizures, which, I mean, well, it's still not going to kill you, but you may wish you were dead. <laughs> I think it's good to get this out at least and state it because it's definitely not a something to take lightly. It's not, it's a, not party a beginner's. Drug. It is not a party drug. <laughs> right. right. And I, I think. Um, you know, really my interest in all this comes from the fact that I've seen so I've seen the mental health crisis that we have in the United States right now. It is so, so big of a problem. And, and I don't think benzodiazepines, which you talk a lot about in your videos, um, are really a great solution that we have. And I, and I find it interesting that there that this could be something useful for people and maybe even um more than just a pill. I think this idea of preparing the mushroom and having a little bit of ritual behind it has a lot of strength too. So, um, well, okay. So I have, maybe you can kind of uh, give us some examples, but I have a package here that I got from somebody on your site that came from Siberia. Um, oh, yay. Yeah, she's finally came. great. She's young. Yeah. You know, she's I have two 20s. different ones. This, this is another one. This one's from oh, yeah. Lithuania. But yeah. yeah. So, yeah, because you vetted a lot of people, right? Yeah. So Alex, go your Alex picked those. She's she's okay. been doing this for most of her 20s. She grew up around the mushroom and she's very passionate about it. And we get into some cool conversations about this mushroom. I want to go visit them because they they grew up with it. Like it's part of her mm -hmm. life and her culture. Well, I've noticed from the comments, the, the video is almost at half a million 
views now, <laughs> oh which is my insane. God, that is ridiculous. Yeah, 400 something thousand. Oh and my God. You, it's, it's fascinating for me to see the comments because very few of them are negative comments. That's um, awesome. Yeah. And then a lot of them are people from Eastern Europe and Russia who, who are like, yeah, we use it all the time. And so it just kind of was an awareness that, yeah, that it's more common in those places for people to just We're be. We're such a mm. mycophobic society in the States. It's so crazy. And much of Europe too, even when I was in Sweden. They didn't used to be, but they are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the last 50 years since modern medicine, they've become way more mycophobic than they used to be. Right. So I, okay. So then maybe you could just say, if I had a package like this, because this is how you might get it and you're going to prepare it. Yeah. What is the process? So first you throw those in a dehydrator and get them out of those packets because they the seals break and they leak and they'll take on moisture okay so throw it in a dehydrator and get that moisture out of it get it cracker dry get it in a jar with a gasket like a mason jar that has this gasket seal lids Mm -hmm. on them you can't use a spaghetti jar lid it's got to have a gasket throw some desiccant packets pull them out of your medicine bottles or some cotton or anything that you can that's going to absorb cotton won't absorb moisture rice doesn't absorb absorb moisture Make sure you get desiccant packets. You can get them off Amazon, but really you can go through vitamin bottles and pull them out and throw them in there and seal it up really good and keep it that way because these mushrooms more than most love moisture and will suck it out of the air. Mm -hmm. And when they get moisture in them, they will mold and they will lose their actives faster. So first is first when you get them in the mail, get them cracker dry and get them in a jar. So as soon as you make your order, go find your jar Find your gasket lid, get you some desiccant packets and get everything ready for when they arrive. So you can do that when you're ready to prepare them. You've got to measure out um, 15 grams of dried mushroom because you can't just use a single mushroom because you risk hot dosing because they vary so widely in strength. So you want to sort of normalize your solution by pulling a little one and then a large one and a couple of medium ones. And I even break off like pieces of different ones and throw them together there to get my 15 grams. And this, would this be about 15 grams? No, that's this, too much. That's more. I don't, you 30, should know what you ordered. Yeah, but, I think I ordered, and I'll than, weigh it out, but I, I, yeah, I think yeah. it's 30. Yeah. But, yeah. And then we want to, I'm trying to, teach the world when they reference dosing on this thing to reference it by volume, not by weight. Because if you're referencing dosing by weight, that means you're eating them dried or you're grinding it and taking it as a powder dried. And that's the quickest way to get completely unpredictable results and to make yourself sick. The only way that anybody should be taking this when they're new to it is as a tea that has been normalized through a 15 gram solution of tea and then dosing it by volume not by weight so you need a cup of water or what is that 250 mils i believe and those 15 grams and set it on the stove about medium heat and get it to a very low simmer and let it go for 20 to 30 minutes if you can make tea you can boil water for tea you can do this if you can make macaroni and cheese you can do it. You just throw it in the water, let it go. You can so, cover it. You can leave it uncovered. Just watch the water. And and I should reference that you have this on your site, a really good yeah, yeah. demonstration. Yep. Um, and, and this is why I wanted to kind of stop as you go through the prep and ask a couple of questions. Um, when, when you are making the tea, you, you talk about it being 20 to 30 minutes. That is in part a temperature thing, right? For decarboxylation from ibutenic acid to muscimol, right? That's so, part of what you're doing with that. When you were asking me, first of all, about Ivo, so then we were talking about just eating a piece of it. Mm-hmm. And now we're getting into starting to convert that ibutenic acid to muscimol. And it turns out it should be a very simple um, first level decarboxylation reaction the simplest one that should happen at room temperature but it doesn't happen at room temperature it's actually a little more difficult than it should be chemically because it is a single decarboxylation reaction it's that single carbon with that carboxyl group one single carboxyl group that's got to come off and so 
it should be easier than it is. We're not sure why it isn't. I've asked a lot of chemists and all we do is toss around ideas that we can get into that some other time. So if you wanna start converting some of that ivotenic acid out, then heat and water is the first way to do it because if you're buying them from vendors on my site, they have not been dried at a high enough heat to start some of that decarboxylation reaction. You got to do that above 165 Fahrenheit, 72 Celsius. Most people aren't drying them like that. So they're going to come not decarboxylated. If you read all over the internet that drying them converts them, that is not true. I listen to talks by mycologists and they say that, and people who should know better, and they say that, and they're repeating bad information instead of going to the science. The science shows definitively that if you're lucky and they happen to have a lot of water in them, they might convert up to about 15% of their IBO to muscimol, just drying at any heat above, say, 100 up to about 150, you might get about a 15% conversion. And that's because you have a fluid environment and some heat. But because you're dehydrating, you've got conversion happening because of heat converging with the fact that your water content is dropping and then where they meet is where everything stops. So you gotta have a fluid medium to have that chemical reaction. So as you lose fluid, you're losing chemical reaction. And so that higher heat gives it a push and you start getting a whole lot of decarb happening before that dehydration happens. And how much? Up to about 30%. But because that's not happening, if you're buying yours online, go ahead and assume zero conversion and that what you're putting in the water is starting the clock on that decarb. Mm -hmm. And what you're going to get is about 30% if you let it run 45 minutes or an hour, you're going to start actually losing actives because they just start to break down over time through a dehydration reaction. So the most you're going to get is about a 30 percent, maybe 35 ish. You can boil it for three hours. There's a three hour boil out there on the Internet, but you lose 50 percent of the actives. Mm -hmm. If you do that, and we're going to talk about other ways to fully decarb. So I am not a proponent of that method. So yeah, cook it for 20, 30 minutes, and you're going to get about a 30% conversion. So you're looking at about 60% ibotenic acid, 30% muscimol, maybe 40% muscimol, give or take. Okay. So then you, you've, you've made your tea, you strain it into a cup. And Add now, water now to what? bring it back up right. to a okay. cup or 250 mils because you want to normalize your solution so that you're always dealing with the same cup of water, even though it's going to change every time you make it because you're dealing with different mushrooms. If you keep using different pieces like that, you're really going to narrow that range of potency a lot by doing that. And as this community grows and hopefully my reach grows, eventually the world will be able to talk about it like this. And a teaspoon is a teaspoon everywhere around the world because it was normalized to that one cup or 250 mils after you took it off the stove so that everyone is starting with that same amount from 15 grams. Okay. Okay. So with 250 milliliters, say, say... <laughs> You're doing this for yourself, but say now I have 250 milliliters, <laughs> but how much is like, you know, you, obviously I have no reference for what would make me, make me sick or like what, what, how much is the next step? Cause that was something I, you know, I know so if you you're probably micro dosing, had the video, but... and here's what I want to tell people is please don't try to trip on this thing first. That is the quickest way to have a negative experience and lose a medicine that is very valuable. Mm -hmm. There are so many ways that this mushroom works. You can handle it raw and it can get in your skin in such small amounts that it starts to communicate with you and you start to feel the effects of it after handling it for several hours. You can dehydrate it and be in the room with the dehydrator and inhale it through the air and sleep and have amazing dreams and be pretty high on it 
just like sort of this contact high through the air. And it's pretty powerful like that. There are many ways to start getting the mushroom inside you and learning about it because it will teach you what you need to take and how you should work with it. If you can just start to communicate with it in some way, some people even start to dream about it before they use it. Some people get them in the mail and dream about it, or they dream about finding it in the forest and they'll learn about it that way through their dreams, then find me. So there are many ways to get into this mushroom without going head on into it. And most people should not take this mushroom like that. This mushroom is a more subtle medicine. It is not psilocybin. It doesn't hit you over the head and you shouldn't look at it that way. This is an ease yourself in. It has plenty to teach you at every level of dosing. And the smaller you start, the better the results you're going to get physically, mentally, and emotionally. Having said that, I didn't know because I didn't have an Amanita Dreamer. So the Mm. first time I took it, I trip dosed on it and it was fucking rough, but it was beautiful. And I got lucky. I just, I took the exact right dose. So most people don't. So Mm. start small and titrate your way up. When I started microdosing after that, I didn't know what to take. So I started with like, a, I think an eighth of a teaspoon and I like tiny little, you know, like mm-hmm. five little drops or something from that tea and it, it did nothing. So I took a quarter teaspoon and I didn't get much out of it. And so the next night I took a half a teaspoon and I got a lot of energy. I focused, I got work done and then I felt really sleepy and I had amazing dreams and I slept really well. And I think I settled into that as my microdose, Mm -hmm. but I've worked with plenty of friends around me, people around me, local to me. And there are several people that need two tablespoons as their microdose. And it took them a while to find it to get there. So that's the range that I'm seeing Mm -hmm. from people. And you won't know till you start. And yeah, no, that's, that's actually great advice. And I, I think contrary to how most people would view well, they would want to know exactly here what is the the size of the dose or whatever. But I like that idea of kind of easing yourself in, but starting low. And I, I just didn't know how low. <laughs> I don't know anybody that's, that's taking an eight or even a fourth. Like the people that I know that started with a fourth, they moved on up to a half mm-hmm. as their okay. microdose. Okay. Yeah, that's and awesome. I have a video on how to find your micro macro and hero doses okay so i'll leave yep. people to go yeah it is useful if you want to deep dive into this for for those of you who are not here or who, who are here for me aminitadreamer.net has ton, i mean it's just like you could spend a day or two non-stop watching videos and and about the the lemon afterwards that's an extra way to do a little bit more conversion right so, but if you're if you have a microdose, you wouldn't be putting lemon, right? Because that's just so tiny. Yeah, because and don't put lemon in it when you're making it, because it'll just go bad faster. Add the lemon when you're using it, and I don't add lemon unless I'm going to be taking at least a, a high hero. I mean, a, a high macro or hero dosing it, mm-hmm. and I don't even measure the lemon if I'm doing a low trip. I just use a slice of lemon like I would in iced tea. Mm-hmm. If I'm doing a big trip, then I'm going to go on and cook it for 45 minutes with lemon in it. And I'll use a half a lemon so that I push more, a little more decarb. I have yet to get sick from my botanic acid. And that's how I work. That's, that's what I do. But it's sort of this thin line because you want ibotenic acid on board your trip because it's, equally important in the trip. And I can talk about that for a very long time. So I don't like, it's this, it's there's, there's a sweet spot between Mm -hmm. having enough IBO that's important to your trip, but not too much that you start to get diarrhea and have to be sitting on the toilet when you would really like to be moving wherever you feel like moving during your trip. So there's this, it's, it's hard to know. And I have yet to play with that. But I probably need to start doing that is start backing off on the lemon 
and taking more and more without lemon and seeing where that is for me. But then it's really going to change with every batch you make, but it shouldn't change much. Mm -hmm. So you kind of got to play with it. But okay. yeah, add lemon when you, if you're microdosing, the only reason I would use lemon if I'm microdosing is if it's getting late and I got to get up tomorrow and I don't want to be up all night doing shit. Cause you, when you microdose, you'll get two hours of feeling motivated and wanting to get stuff done, which is great. You can get your stuff ready for tomorrow and then you slide into sleep. But if I forget and it's already 10 at night, but I need to take it then I'll add lemon and I'll throw it back on the stove or throw it in the microwave or whatever, and just heat it up again and try to push a little more decarb so that I'm not up for another two hours. The more I bow, then the longer you're going to be awake. Okay. So I feel like we got the tea pretty well. Um, what are some of the other ways that it, that it is prepared generally? And, and do you have a preference for different ways? Because this is, a, you were talking about a water-based tea. and So there's yeah. different ways to use it besides the tea. Right. And then there's full decarb, which is the hardest thing to do. It's not hard. It's, I don't know how to say it. You can't just do it any old way you want. There's very specific ways to do it because it is chemically difficult, physically easy. So... One of them is to use raw milk, and that's really easy. You get raw milk, you bring it to room temperature, you make the tea, throw a couple of tablespoons in it, cover it with a towel, let it sit, and it makes yogurt. It's a taste amazing. I called it Soma after researching Soma and Kevin Feeney's work and Dr. Trent Austin's work, and I believe Soma is yogurt, and I believe I made it. That's just my hypothesis. I defend it in a video, mm -hmm. but... It was its own experience at extremely low doses, like very, very small amounts that I would take and consider my microdose was a trip dose on muscamol, full decarb, 100% decarb. It was very easy to do it. If you are vegan and you don't want to use milk, uh, I'm working with one of my patrons that took my microdosing class, which I might be teaching again in February. If you're a patron of mine, you'll find out about it first. And they're talking about using ginger and making a ginger bug fermentation with lactobacillus bacteria that will do a 100% decarb. The three-hour boil is considered a 100% decarb. There's no, there's no scenario where I like that because you lose half your compounds, mm -hmm. half your, your actives. But I mean, if you just don't want to use raw milk and you don't like the ginger bug idea for whatever reason, and you don't have what you need to do it, then three hour boil it is. Mm -hmm. So, and I guess what I was prepping for is you also um, put it into an oil and you also smoke it and you mm -hmm. don't have to get into all of those, right? No, we would love to get into those. Yeah, but so so give 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 kind of an overview of those. And for reference, you talk about most of this on your site too. So there really are good deep dives into all of it. Um, so my favorite way is smoking it. And it's funny that my whole first year of my channel, I thought that it was ridiculous when I heard about people smoking it. And when I saw Hamilton smoking it with the uh, Sami, you know, up in the forest. I was like, the only reason I'm giving this any credit is because these are original people's use. And I trust that use. So I did it on camera and I just got a pipe and I shoved it in there and I started smoking it. And I smoked and smoked and smoked for 20 minutes. And I'm like, geez, I'm not getting anything. That was bullshit. And then as soon as I turned the camera off and stood up, it hit me and I turned the camera right back on. And it was the most amazing experience that I have ever had on Amanita. Since then, now... I smoke it ritualistically when I do retreats, when we do our solstice celebrations, when I drum and ceremony, when I want to talk to the elders, I smoke it. I smoke it every night in my smoke blends that I make to calm at the end of the night and just sort of, it's not a good replacement for microdosing. It doesn't do the same thing that microdosing does for panic and anxiety and all of the mental health things that microdosing does. Smoking won't do that. 
it seems like smoking is just only a momentary, temporary use thing. And when it wears off, there's no lasting effects of it. So I use it like someone would drink in a beer in the evening. And I just smoke my smoke blend <clears throat> that has the Amanita in it. I smoke straight Amanita, copious amounts of it to travel with the elders and journey for ceremonies. It's my favorite way to trip on it. Mm -hmm. It's just beautiful and amazing. And I just love it. It's so amazing. So amazing. Awesome. I recommend and, it highly. And uh, <laughs> I feel, and then the other one is you, you, you put it, you have a topical oil, oil extractions. Right? Or is yeah. that topical and ingested? Well, there's no science on oral ingestion. There's no lore or ancient use about ingestion of the oils. I don't even know what's in the oil extract. I know that ibotenic acid and muscimol are water-based and they should not come across in the oil. And yet they did. And when I made my first oil extraction and I took the mushroom out and boiled it to make the tea to extract the water-based actives out of it, it was empty. There was nothing in it. It was all in the oil-based one. I've learned since then by talking to a couple of chemists and scientists that are working on this mushroom that there are beta-glucans that are coming across in it, which would explain why it's working topically as an anti-inflammatory painkiller. And it's very powerful for people <clears throat> who have sciatica and nerve issues, damaged nerves. I'm hearing from them. You can see all the like the feedback on my Etsy store, like that, that mm -hmm. people are using it for or whatever. So these are oil-based extractions. Ancient use uses an animal fat. More modern use is using extra virgin olive oil, but it doesn't seem to matter. They come across in, in any fat. So I used it topically for some surgery that oral surgery I had. I use it for lower back pain, whatever. But I was curious about oral use. So I used it orally. I got an interesting experience out of it. I wanted to make chocolate, but you can't use a water-based compound. So I had to use the oil to make my chocolate. So now I use that. I pop those, you know, I keep them in my refrigerator. I use those orally. And then pantherina, which has 10 times the actives as Amanita muscaria, I make pantherina oil also. And I can't tell anyone to use that shit orally because like, it's so strong. It's so strong. And I don't know what's happening there with oral ingestion of any of these. And I know when I use the pantherina oil, like I just put it on my finger and licked it. And I did that two or three times. And at some point, I don't remember, I blacked out. And I woke up the next day and my house was clean, like perfectly clean. <laughs> I, cl I clearly went on a tear and just cleaned my house and had a good time doing it. So. <laughs> I love it. Um, uh, so we have, um, uh, well, before we get to everyone's questions, because some people definitely have questions. Um, do you um do you have anything else you want to kind of like dive into with prep and dosage oh, well maybe maybe here's a good one on dosage when, when you do smoke it how much are you using and I, and I only ask and I know you kind of say go up it's it's kind of to figure out what is the small amount you know because if well if I started filling a bowl I have like a little small straight pipe uh -huh. it's got a bowl about the size of an American or Canadian dime and I smoked that whole bowl the first time. That didn't do anything. So I smoked that much over and over. And if I probably hit that eight times, that bowl, before I started to feel anything. Since then, if I really want to just smoke straight Amanita, I roll a joint and I'll smoke the whole thing. And sometimes like a bong, like a water pipe, because it can be harsh on the throat. It's got a pretty strong throat hit, mm -hmm. depending on how big your bowl is. If it's like the size of a quarter, an American or Canadian quarter, probably for me, I would smoke two of those and then see how I feel. And then, I mean, if I was traveling and journeying, I would just keep smoking. I wouldn't stop. I would smoke continuously for two hours and not stop. 
but I mean, this, I've been doing this for three years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Fascinating. Well, um, shall we open it up for questions? I think that might be useful. Um, I, there are some in the comments, but, um, uh, maybe if, let's see, what is a good way to do this? Uh, if you guys want to just kind of raise your hand and ask, and I'll see you. Go through yeah. the comments first. Let me skim the comments. You want to skim let the me comments? See. Yeah, let me. See. Yeah, you can, you can dive through some of these and just answer them. Yeah, know, let me go quick. in order and I'll answer them quickly. Wonder why there are no homeopathic hospitals. Oh, yeah. Don't even get me started on that. I'm going to skip that one right now because I'll just get all, all mad. <laughs> uh, do you eat it dried? We covered that. Hey, Janet. Uh, dehydrator goes to 160. I have a video on dehydrators. I highly suggest you watch that. It's very informative. Go watch that. Uh, yes, there will be some. Oh, hey, Bradford. Yay. According to Dream Society. Uh, Brad, there's a macrodosing protocol. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Brad, for pulling some weight around here. Appreciate it. Because some I have been a way of stretching a poor yield. For absolutely, 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 Tabitha. I think so. Not only because it's just amazing, but yeah, absolutely. It's in the section. Oh, she was asking, could it be a way of stretching a poor yield? I, I, I believe so. What would be dose from tincture recipe? Um. My small dose in tincturing, depending on the strength of the tincture, is one dropper full to about when I was really in a lot of pain with my oral surgery, I did six droppers full. And I would have considered that a pretty high micro, macro ish dose. What amount is for smoking? We covered that. Fibromyalgia. Um, I think that I have that too. And I think a lot of what's going on in that is just is an inflammation response and a mast cell response, which there's new research about this mushroom working on mast cell responses and inflammation. And I have a video on that I just uploaded yesterday on the YouTube channel. You tried dry vaping it. Yeah, I have a dry herb vape. I'm really not impressed with it. I want it to work. I just don't like it. I mean, maybe I need to buy a different brand or something. I don't know. If you microdosing magic mushroom and corning amanita at night, what happens if you microdose psilocybin in the morning? Uh, I, I haven't done that. I can't speak to that. Sorry, Kia. Hey, Kia. Please look into your summer recipe plus psilocybin DMT circuits. This combo underpins the archetypal Superman, red, white, Mario, Papa. Yikes, that'd be a hell of a stack. I'd actually like to try that. That sounds cool. <laughs> I would really like to try that. I just, Chris, man, being in the States, it's, I may need to go to another country where it's decriminalized and stack it like that. That would be a blast, I think. If it has potential for being aerosolized, is there potential for a nasal spray? I don't see why not. Although ibotenic acid really freaking burns your eyes and your nose. So that may be a, it may have to be a full decarb. And even then, like, I don't know, muscamol is not an acid anymore. It might be all right. Can you combine magic mushroom and amanita? I, I don't know. I can't speak to that. Talk to you at some other time. I, I have another question here, too. Yeah. Because uh, I had some people write uh, on, on the post before to ask. Um, and then we'll get Eric his hands up. Oh, yep. <clears throat> so, right. um how I, I think people are interested in how this works from a mental health perspective. It obviously helped you. Could could you touch briefly on like, are, do you feel like it's, um, if you stopped using it, do you think things would return? Yeah. Um, yeah. Something is permanently broken because I'm just, I've lived my entire life in trauma. And I think that from birth that, my brain grew in relationship to trauma and I don't think I have the morphology anymore to live a normal life. I'm not going to say never. And maybe my morphology can change over time. And maybe it's trying to do that. I don't know, but I found for me so far, I 
do need to take, I can maintain if I'm not going through stressful events, but I'm wondering if I will ever be able to handle stress without my body turning it into panic attacks and harmful thoughts and sleep deprivation. Mm. Just normal stress. Like when my channel blows up, it goes through these fits where there's a huge influx of people and shitty people and shitty comments and getting a new stalker. Like I've got so many stalkers. And then every time there's a new rush of people to the channel, I get two more stalkers to add to the list. Like that kind of stuff keeps me up at night and uh, worrying about doing right by everybody. There's so much to worry about in this field and what I'm doing. And so I don't know if I will be okay without it, Mm -hmm. but what it has done is give me a normal life. It's shown me what it must be like for the normal people that don't have trauma how they get to deal with life and stress and to actually think that something doesn't matter. Like that was foreign to me. Say you get an offender bender and to just be like, Oh, well, I hope they're okay. And get out of the car. Check. Are you okay? Cool. Let's call and let's do the paperwork. And like my stress just not even spike. And in the past that was full on chaos full on panic attacks. Oh my God, I won't, everything's going to go wrong. I won't be able to deal with it. I won't, I don't have time to deal with this. Why does this always happen to me? Like this whole cascade of negativity Mm -hmm. and very little rattles my cage. Now things that should probably don't. And I'm learning how much better outcomes are when you really flow with everything and nothing really rattles me. Mm -hmm. But if it starts to rattle me, I, I I look and it's been a month, two months since I've microdosed. Gotcha. Okay. Um, let's let's get your question, Eric, and then we'll finish going through the comments. I think that'd be great. Okay. First of all, I would just like to express my gratitude for the amount of research and your caring and the depth the depth of your caring and your heart, you know, for to make the world a better place. And to bring this lineage forward and the wholeness of it and, you know, the opportunity to meet elders, you know, for the people in this society that, you know, are just unplugged. Um, mm-hmm. So my question, a couple of questions. One is after you, after they become crispy in the dehydrator, are they done or does it need a, 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 a continual time? No. No, crispy, the crispy. only thing you're trying to get them is cracker dry. There's no cooking right. them. You're just right. trying to get them dry. Okay. Um, I have some that have no, that I didn't put any desiccant in, but they're still crispy. So they're probably, they're in mason jars, probably fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, once in a while, um, well, first of all, I started a couple months ago, kept in, getting interrupted and I live on the Northern California coast. So I've been harvesting them fresh. I know there's one that was like 10 inches tall and that big around. Jeez. Yeah. Y'all like... been popping. Y'all have been really blessed this yeah. year. Yeah. 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 Um, once, so I'm going to start up again, maybe tomorrow. And, um, I know occasionally I'll take like a half a milligram or whatever of benzo. If I have to do something in my day is kind of crazy. Is that, does that cancel anything with the, it, with, you're going to stack them because benzos work on the GABA okay, receptors. So and this note. one also works on GABA receptors. So, so I would consider that stacking, which is not good. I don't know. Oh, okay. The stack. Okay. Um, the only other thing is, um, I guess there's a replay of this, Bob. I, I am recording it. So yeah, we can make, and I yeah. would find that available um, where uh, I'll send it. I'll send it to Amanita dreamer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. She can send out if she wants. Okay. I'll oh, put it on also. my Patreon. <laughs> I'll make it available to patrons who didn't get to watch it. I'll leave it up on my Patreon. Okay. And is there, I know you said if you're microdosing every once in a while, you need to up level the, the dosage to that, that that's part of the microdosing experience. Is there a frequency of that or the mushroom will tell you? I had, I went up because after about a year, I had been using it in so many different ways that I wasn't afraid to go up. And I liked the effect I got when I went from half a teaspoon to a whole teaspoon. I just decided to make that choice and I'm, I'm happier there. 
So it's least. not anything that's necessary to go up. Oh, okay. I mean, if you like where you are, you know, I just was playing around with it. I took a teaspoon. Okay. I really liked that better. So okay. I, was, yeah, I guess I was there. hearing that every once in a while you need to go up a little bit. and then nah. go back and, Okay. All right. Nah. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Eric. I'm so yep. glad you're here. Me too. Thank you. You, you want to dive through the comments? Uh, one. Yeah, yeah. They've been on. rolling, haven't mm -hmm. they? I think Haley, Haley's on. Uh, was the last one you didn't get to. Are there any drug complex that neutralize its effects? Um, there's the only problem is that it's not anything that neutralizes the effects other than if you are a cannabis user, you won't get anything from Amanita. And I'm glad you wrote that, Haley, because mm. I was going to forget to say that. Mm. And you'll just be disappointed. But I have a video interviewing two people that were heavy cannabis users who were in withdrawals coming off of cannabis and getting on Amanita. It's a really interesting interview. You should listen mm. to it. Any of you that are interested in that. Bad look, yeah. Mm. Could the microdose futures thing be a state of honed foresight? The upping the processing microdose futures thing be a state. Do you mean the ibotenic acid being able to see the future from upping the processing? Right. See, like it's my opinion, Tabitha, that we are natural communicators on the fourth dimensional plane and that precognition is our birthright. Like that's part of our onboarding as being humans. It's, it's one of the senses that we were born with, but when it's not taught and honed and it's even actually gaslighted and shamed out of you, it just withers like any other talent that you shove down or don't use. And yeah, I mean, maybe that ibotenic acid is just tweaking that running you at such a higher state that you're actually tapping back into that natural ability for precognition. And there are some some new studies in the last couple of years on precognition that are actually really interesting to read. That it is possible and that we are doing it and that we can. Bradford coach told me it's best not to use Amanita for a day or two after using psilocybin rationales at Amanita will short circuit. Well, I disagree, Bradford. I'm not a coach or a therapist, but knowing that psilocybin is going to work with serotonin receptors and that Amanita works with GABA receptors, there are plenty of people out there taking benzodiazepines and SSRIs simultaneously. There is no drug interaction pharmaceutically. Hmm. By that, it wouldn't make sense that these two would cancel each other out or short circuit anything. If I can get back to Canada soon, I'll use them both and see what happens. I just can't do it here in America. I'm not gonna do anything illegal here. Do you speak a little about muscazone, please? The UV conversion of tooth acid. Um, so in the European amanitas, they will actually convert in the presence of sunlight, instead of ibotenic acid to muscomol, they'll convert ibotenic acid to muscazone. And muscazone has its own active properties that I haven't taken and I can't use and I can't speak to. So I would like to, but you kind of have to be there and dry it out in the sun to get that and then take it there. And I don't know, maybe I'll talk to a couple of my suppliers over there during their harvesting season and ask them to dry some in the sun and send them to me. I should do that. <clears throat> I want to do that, Tabitha. Yeah, I don't know how to raise your hand, Melissa. I couldn't figure it out either. I really can't. I've tried to find out for other people and I still don't know how to do it. I could help I think with it's that in the chat. Oh, it, it's in reactions. Uh, anyway, bar, uh, what's an oil dose if you just put the dropper in your mouth, assuming the oil was jam packed with the muscaria and how long? OK, so that's giving you medical advice. So I can't answer that question. The oil, I have no idea. I know that extra virgin olive oil is shelf stable for a couple of years. And I know that the actives in water are stable for months. I know that not in water, just in the mushroom, it's stable for a year. So I'm assuming that when it's in an oil, that it just from what I know of chemistry, Rob, you can back me up on this or correct it. Um, if something is in an oil, it's pretty locked in there and in a lot of really strong bonds that aren't easy to break as opposed to being in water, which are easy bonds to break. Knowing that, I am absolutely pulling out of my ass the number 
of it's going to be shelf stable for two years. <laughs> We're still in the early stages of this shit, y'all. I don't know. <laughs> Um, if folks are interested, you can look into almost every culture, all the archangels, cartoon heroes, blue breastplates, plus red capes that defeats the demon archetype. I get, Chris, I see that everywhere, the blue and the red archetypes. And you have to wonder. Stefan, nature provides. I agree. And it used to just confound me that I would go my whole life and couldn't find a natural answer to anxiety. Mm -hmm. Dreamer, if you ever have the good fortune to harvest from where lightning has struck, the mycelial mass will hold the influx. You don't even know about lightning, Chris. I've got a video I need to make on lightning. I ran into a woman on um, TikTok who's doing her uh, PhD thesis on lightning. And her thesis is that the mycelium actually pack the tree with water, like run water offsetting its polarity so that it will be attractive to lightning like ain't that some shit anyway i'm trying to find her she quit posting and she's not responding to messages she's probably just knee deep in her phd or whatever and don't have time to mess with some random stranger on the internet what about benzo's bradford what's your question there's a disconnect from that comment to whatever your comment was prior. Yeah, um, I was just when there was talk about combining medications um, or things that you shouldn't combine Amanita with, I thought it might be interesting to talk about if it's safe to use Amanita mushroom in micro dosing form or macro or trip doses when you are still using benzos see that's the that's the question everyone wants me to answer because so many people are coming off benzodiazepines and they're using this mushroom to do it but that's practicing medicine without license uh even even to say even, okay um there's I not think, a single thing i can say about that hmm. that's safe for me to say yeah it seems uh, it just seems like it's an important issue to find a, a solution to somehow um well, but, the only way anyone could speak to it is if someone did drug study, trials yeah, and ran yeah. it past the FDA, like, or there was a paper I could reference or something. Well, all I know is I wouldn't do it, but that's just me, and I know nothing, so, and nobody asked, so, um, <laughs> anyway, that's all I got to say. Yeah, Kia, let me know if you sun dry some and I, I would like that, especially if like I can get someone to do it because I, I know that they're still harvesting in Russia right now and some are in, in Germany are still harvesting. So I may still actually be able to get some, but y'all, Kia has a um, integration therapy business. If y'all ever take something and need or want some integration help, and then she does work in an office in Sweden. Melissa, I'm going to get to you just a second. Let me finish this one. Uh, Tabitha, there's a guy who does a cold water sun extraction on YouTube. Yeah, that would be great because what he's doing then is converting to muscazone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. R.E., the ladies thesis, 100%. I still don't know what you're talking about, Chris. That was the lightning thing you were talking about. Oh, the ladies thesis. And then what did you say? What about... I uh, lost it now. Whose comment was that, Chris? Oh, Chris is saying that her, you agree with it 100%. Yeah, right. It's crazy. Y'all, I say all the time about how incredibly intelligent and sentient mycelium is, like, more than us. Very often in the forest, I see people kick out this mushroom. Can I still? Absolutely. Nothing wrong with it. Yeah. I harvest some that deer have kicked over or knocked over or whatever. I have some fermenting in the fridge to use the final liquid topically that I got from the German channel. Interesting. For a ferment topically. I know that people use the alcohol extractions topically. I don't know how though, because it seems watery, like it would run off your skin. But I mean, topical is topical, whether it's in an oil or a water or an alcohol. Mm -hmm. Cool. It's still going to get across. 
My sealant itself and leverage trees to anchor the lightning and acts as the conduit for interdimensional data. Now that is some crazy shit right there, Chris. Now I'm going to be thinking about that for a very long time. Holy shit, man. Which Chris is this messing with my eggs in my head? Where is it? Chris? Which Chris is this? I want to know who's fucking with me. He knows he's messing with my head, too. I'm going to be thinking about this for so long. Oh, my God. Uh, Devorah, I can. I did it, and it made me throw up and run to the washroom. You did what, Devorah? How did you prepare it? Oh, you added them to benzos. Yikes. Ouch. That sucks. Let me stop here and talk to Melissa. What's up, Melissa? Hi, can you hear me? I can. Hi. Oh, thanks for being here. Absolutely. Uh, Thank you. In uh, one of your videos, you say if vegetation in an area looks like it was sprayed by glyphosate, you don't pick in those areas. Would you explain what toxins you think the muscaria can absorb? And if we find these mushrooms along the side of a road or in parking lots, are you concerned about car fumes or chemical fertilizers? And also, I've seen it around like conifers and like random hardwood trees along the road. So it'd be hard to say like which, what are all the trees they grow around? But are there any trees that you never see it growing around? So the only reason I don't pick where I know for a fact they're spraying is because it was recent. And I don't want that shit from the ground on the mushroom that I'm boiling and adding heat to. So in that instance, no, I won't. But roadsides and all that don't bother me. Be, and I have a whole video talking about the, the issue is heavy metals because mycelium will pull up heavy metals. This mushroom pulls up very specific heavy metals for different purposes that it's going to use them for. The ones that it's not using or that it doesn't need, it won't pull up in very in an amount that's actually anything to worry about. But anyway, I go through every single heavy metal in a video and I talk about it and I show studies and proof of everything and where I get my information. So it's called heavy metals and amanita or amanita and heavy metals. So if you want to look at that, if you don't believe me or you want to know if you can trust my take, I leave the links to all the studies and you can come to your own conclusion. And then uh, you asked me three questions. Spraying and toxins. Aww. What else did you ask me? Um, any trees that you never see it growing around? So um, it doesn't grow with oaks, but it doesn't matter whether I go down the list or not, because there is, I have a video on where to look. And in the description of that video is a list worldwide and you find your area and it will tell you what trees it's growing with in your area. Mark Niemöller made the list. He owns a um, Amanita Muscaria group on Facebook on Amanita Muscaria growth patterns. And he owns that list. That group and he painstakingly put that list together took him like four years i think so just look in the description find where you are and read what it's growing with and that way you'll know where to look in your area and then you had one more question oh me um Didn't you? i think it, i think it was just uh about like the car fumes uh yeah <laughs> if you think of it let me know Let's uh, let's get Janet's question, and then I want to kind of wrap things up to be cognizant of your time. But um, Janet, okay, I just have a couple quick ones um, on on eating it. On eating it, um, I'm just curious: eating it dried or eating it just like kind of not dried, or both, or or does it matter? Well, because you're only getting like a 10 to 15% conversion between raw and dried, they're like the same. Okay, that's one. And then the other was you were mentioning about how you need to take this and you feel like maybe something in your brain is just kind of permanently broken, but you could go a couple months maybe not taking it. And then when the stress, um, you know, goes up, you, you start to microdose. And I'm curious when you do that, do you follow? the protocol like that you gave in the, in the workshop. Yeah. 
I go back on my protocol. But I mean, I have changed clearly because I've never in my life been able to go without a drug or drinking or something to stop the panic. And now I go months without anything. And I know Amanita did that. And I would never have to take anything except that life is stressful in 2021. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah, so that might not be correct to say you think something is yeah. permanently broken. Yeah, We're all yeah. under stress and we all kind of go That's nuts true. when it hits a high level. Anyway, thank you for the information. Right, right, right. Um, is there a good video? Drew just put up on our site, digging into the science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Heavy Metals is in that playlist. Dreamer, do you have an encrypted email? I'd love to send you some of my thoughts, but not ready to share them on a public forum. Uh, This is being recorded and I'm already inundated with people that have learned how to get my email and I don't put it out there. So if you can figure out how to email me through the world somewhere, feel free, (laughs) but I'm not putting it out there. Sorry. Um, I will take messages on Instagram because they go in a held folder and I check them like once a week when I can, if you want to message me over there. Awesome. Well, hey, I wanted to say thank you for taking the time and and doing this. I know this was kind of a combined, uh, my patrons, your patrons. I wanted to wrap up that video that we did because it was just, it did so well. And so many people found it interesting. Um, Oh, my Etsy store opens Friday plug. Oh, well, and actually this is a good point to point out for any, I, I have a feeling most of you who are still on this call know about this, but on AmanitaDreamer.net, you sell tons of stuff um, and you have the ability to become a patron and have chats with you. Um, You do them a couple of times a month. So that's a fantastic place to, for people to go and continue the conversation. And it, it, you know, I'm a big fan of supporting people who are doing interesting work, whether as creators or as people like you who are kind of diving into the science and use of this medicine. And so definitely, if you're not already a patron, go over there and, and support her for that too. Um, what time Friday will the store open, Amanita? 10 a.m. Oh. I only open it once a month, but actually this time I'm doing it at the beginning of December for Christmas, you know, to try to get everything in the mail. And then I'm not going to open it again till the middle of January. So 10 and o'clock in the morning. Eastern Standard Time. Yeah, Eastern sorry. Standard. Sorry. Okay, I always you. forget thank to you. do that. <laughs> Thanks. I'm, I always forget that. That's awesome. And if anybody in the future wants to drop us an idea for another video to do together, I think we'd both be into that. That'd be super fun. (laughs) Yeah, we don't live too far apart. We're like, you know, if we both drive and meet in the middle, it's not a bad drive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Gosh, thank you everyone for coming also and having questions and being engaged. Um, I hope this was useful to some degree. I'm just trying to like wrap things up because I feel like we could go on for hours, but um, it was really neat neat to see everybody's smiling faces here. And also thank you for your wisdom as everybody seems to write as well. This was very helpful too for me. When I, I, I I will try it and and report back, I guess. (laughs) If you have questions, hit me up, Rob. Don't try winging it if you don't know what, you know, if you have a question about something. I will, I will. I have the inside scoop now, so. And we do Zooms with my patrons. So if any of you aren't a patron of me and you want to be, we do private Zooms and then we do like Saturday group Zooms and stuff, so. That's awesome. Okay, we'll wrap it up now. Thank you, everyone. This is fun.